Okay, so something I really want to know is how do we know the circumference of the Earth? And not just today, granted, I don't know that either, but historically when we didn't have the science that we have today. Like, how did we know? To get to the bottom of this, Joss and I are going to recreate an ancient calculation from our two distant points on the globe. This calculation was first attempted thousands of years ago, and they got impressively close, maybe within a few percentage points. But here at Howtown, we want to get way more precise than that. We want to know how modern scientists got to this exact number. And while we're at it, why is it so close to an even 40,000 kilometers? To answer these questions, we have to confront a fact that's frustrated people for centuries. The Earth isn't actually a sphere. The first good estimate of Earth's size came from the guy credited with creating this map, Eratosthenes. A bunch of ancient historians wrote about him, so we can kind of piece together some details of his life and works. Can you put Eratosthenes in context for me in time? Like, where should I place him in my mind in history? Well, it's the 3rd century BC, the time of the ancient Greeks, about 50 years after Alexander the Great. And Eratosthenes was born in this Greek colony in northern Africa. He studied abroad up in Athens, where he would have learned about the evolving model of the universe. The popular one at the time had this spherical Earth at the center, with the moon, sun, and planets orbiting really far away. Eratosthenes was hired on as the chief librarian at the famous Library of Alexandria, where he had access to thousands of texts that helped him piece together this slightly warped picture of the known world. He was only aware of about 4% of Earth's surface, but he was still able to calculate the size of the whole planet by making one simple observation. He had heard about a city to the south, the city of Syene, where at noon on the summer solstice, there were no shadows because the sun was directly overhead. But at the same moment up in Alexandria where he was, there was a shadow. This made sense if the Earth was curved and the sun was very far away. The rays would come in practically parallel. And so when they lined up with an obelisk in Syene, it would be off in Alexandria. Now here comes the key insight. If you have a line slicing through two parallel lines, this angle is the same as this angle. That's just always true. So the angle formed by this shadow is the same as the angle between these two cities. So at noon on the summer solstice, Eratosthenes went out and measured this angle as 1 50th of a circle. So he knew the distance from Alexandria to Syene was 1 50th of the way around the Earth. Okay, so he was already in Alexandria. He could get the angle of the shadow there, knowing that there was no shadow in Syene. And from that, calculate the angle of like the tip of the pizza slice in between those two cities. Exactly. You and I are actually coincidentally perfectly situated to recreate this experiment because, and maybe I'll use this, this. Uh, we have a visual aid on hand. So this is Alexandria and this is Syene, approximately north south of each other. And if you look at where we are, you're in New York, I'm in Bogota, we're on the same north south line. So our line goes all the way actually through the, the north and south poles. Exactly. So we're, we're perfectly situated to find this polar circumference. I'm here on my terrace in Bogota, Colombia with my carefully calibrated scientific instrument. Adam, I'm here on my rooftop in Brooklyn. Not supposed to be up here, but if someone asks, I'll tell them we're doing ancient science. The experiment is underway and it is a beautiful day to measure the Earth. It wasn't such a beautiful day in Bogota. The sun wasn't cooperating. So we tried again the next day with Joss setting up inside and we were able to get some data. Joss, your shadow was much longer with an angle of about 51 degrees, while my shadow was only 16. Using the same basic principles, we can see that the difference between the shadow angles is the angle between our positions, 35 degrees, or just about a tenth of the way around the globe. You know the angle, but in order to calculate the circumference from that, you still need to know how big the crust of that pizza slice is, right? Exactly. You multiply that crust of the pizza slice so it fills out the whole pizza, in our case, by 10, in Eratosthenes' case, by 50. For us, I could cheat and just look this up, and I got a distance of 4,010 kilometers. Multiply that by 10, you get 40,100 kilometers, which is really close to the actual value. We're not really sure how Eratosthenes figured out his distance. At the time, distances were measured by repeatedly stretching a rope of a known length, or by professional pacers called bematists counting their strides. The tricky thing is he used the unit stadia, the length of a stadium, and people still argue about how long that actually was. 
Using one set of numbers, it looks like he was off by about 15%. But here's another estimate by a different expert that puts him just about 1% off, which is pretty impressive. Hmm. But it kind of doesn't matter how close he got. What matters is that his logic worked. Like this was a good method. The method method. was good. And people pretty much used this same method for hundreds of years afterwards. Now, it would be nice to think that if only Eratosthenes had been able to make his measurements out to, say, 10 decimal places, he would have correctly arrived at the exact circumference. But that wouldn't have worked, no matter how precise he got, because Eratosthenes' calculation was based on the incorrect assumption that the Earth is a sphere. My name is Derek I. Western. I'm a uh, physicist at NOAA's National Geodetic Survey. And I map out exactly how not round the Earth is. This is my real business card of friend me for me. Punk rocket scientist. When Derek was in college, he played guitar in this band. One, two, three, four! We had a bunch of us had yeah, this band. There was this complete disregard for any kind of authority. The part of that, though, is like, I want to find out for myself how the world works. How does this work? How does that work? I want to dig in on this. That was pretty much the motto of scientists in 17th century Europe, who were running around questioning authority left and right. This one scientist, Jean Richet, was working in South America. How does this work? How does that work? When he noticed that his pendulum clock was running slower than expected. Zut alors. A malfunctioning clock doesn't seem that noteworthy, but it caught the attention of a math professor at Oxford named Isaac Newton. Mm, how does that work? I want to dig in on this. The only real explanation was gravity is weaker there. The pendulum wasn't accelerating as fast due to gravity, so it took longer to complete a full swing, losing like two and a half minutes every day. If gravity's weaker at the equator, like what, what would, would possibly, possibly cause, cause that? that? Oh, I bet the Earth's fatter at the equator. It probably should be spinning. It wouldn't be a sphere, but this ellipsoid, they called it. This is this is really confusing to me because I, th- there's lots of pictures of the Earth from space, <laughs> and it is round. It is incredibly round. Yeah, it looks... It looks like a perfect circle, but if you if you look closely enough, like if you look at this picture from this European satellite, this is a satellite that's centered perfectly over the equator and the prime meridian, and I can draw a perfect circle around it. And if we zoom in, the radius matches at the poles, it lines up perfectly. But down here at the equator, the earth is spilling over. It's about 21 kilometers wider. And that means at the equator, you'd be further from the center of mass. And so gravity would be weaker. And there's another consequence. The circumference around the poles would be smaller than the circumference around the equator. This was a really controversial idea at the time. People weren't really on board with the whole gravity thing, especially the French, but Newton's claim could be tested. On an ellipsoid, the Earth curves slower at the poles than at the equator, which means you'd have to travel a greater distance at the poles to see the same exact change in your angle. So the French sent two teams of scientists to Ecuador and Finland to see if they could disprove this. And they used triangulation. So they basically would cite two different landmarks, which would give them the angle between them. They could use that to build up this web of triangles. And then with a bunch of trigonometry, they could figure out the distance from A to B. And this sort of arduous process proved that, yeah, the Earth was an ellipsoid. Newton was right. They were also able to use this data to calculate the perimeter of this ellipsoid. It was 123 million of this French unit, the king's foot. But the punks of 18th century France didn't want a unit handed down from the monarchy. So in 1791, they created the meter. It was set as exactly one ten millionth of the distance between the equator and the poles. The king's feet had been eliminated, and then two years later, so was the king's head. So the circumference of the Earth was set, this nice round 40,000 kilometers. Surely no future discoveries could possibly change this calculation. If you look it up, the internet tells you that the polar circumference of the Earth is not 40,000 kilometers, but 7.863 kilometers more. And that number comes from this little known corner of the U.S. government you probably never heard of, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's Office of Geomatics. NGA is a little bit of a unique organization. We provide imagery intelligence and support of national defense, uh, of our national policymakers, The larger agency collects and analyzes tons of satellite imagery. In 2011, they helped create this two-scale model and then a perfect life-size replica of bin Laden's compound in North Carolina, so SEAL Team 6 would have a place to practice. And the Office of Geomatics is busy defining exactly where everything is, the precise coordinate system of the Earth. 
And that's tricky to do because it turns out the Earth isn't a perfect ellipsoid either. If you remember those 18th century French scientists, they started to notice that gravity was acting weird, weaker than expected in some places, stronger than expected in others. They wound up realizing that the Earth was, as we refer to it, a lumpy potato. This is a depiction of that lumpy potato. It's not a sphere, not an ellipsoid, it's a geoid. That's exaggerated in scale. The average human being is never going to notice that. But you can see where gravity is stronger, the Earth kind of bulges out, but only like 70 meters or so. And then where it's weaker, like at the tip of India, it sort of sags inward like 100 meters or so. So what would cause all these differences in, in gravity? The simple answer is the moon. Um, so basically for two reasons. One is the big one. A lot of people think that a collision between the Earth and another planetoid billions of years ago probably spawned the moon and left both bodies a little asymmetric. Then the moon is really big relative to the Earth, and so the tidal forces we get are really big. So that's keeping the Earth molten, it's keeping the plates moving around. So you end up with this weird asymmetric blob. AKA the geoid. Does geoid just mean the shape of Earth, our planet? That's what's sort of funny is like, we've gone through centuries trying to name the shape of the Earth. First it was flat. Then we were like, no, it's a sphere. Then we said, no, it's this ellipsoid. Now we gave it a new name that just means Earth-shaped. <laughs> like, what shape is the Earth? Earth-shaped. And that really set off over a century of folks running around all over the world with increasingly uh, improving methods to measure gravity. It was the USSR who came up with the very first ever gravity model. It's kind of contour map for gravity. This came out in 1952, and just five years later, they sent up the first satellite, Sputnik. Today, a new moon is in the sky. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite, one of the great scientific feats of the age. Their geoid models helped them track the exact orbits of spacecraft, and satellites in turn helped them create better maps of Earth. Another satellite is greatly refining our map-making ability. Reflecting sunlight from its 100-foot shiny surface, Pagios is simultaneously photographed by widely separated ground stations throughout the world. Pagios is covered with precision reflectors, bouncing back laser beams from ground stations. It will be so stable that its reflected signals can be used to detect and analyze how fast the continents are drifting apart. The Navstar Global Positioning System will be a worldwide network of satellites transmitting precise, jam-resistant navigational signals. This unique system will provide ships, aircraft, and land vehicles with the capability to determine their positions to an accuracy of less than 30 feet. So little by little, satellites refined our understanding of Earth's exact shape and this underlying geoid. And they came up with this equation that describes the geoid's contours in incredible detail. It's very complicated, it's very long, it has 180 of these terms. It's not the most practical thing to sit around and calculate. And so in 1984, the US Defense Mapping Agency settled on an approximation, an ellipsoid centered exactly at the Earth's center of mass that best lines up with the geoid. There'd be large swaths of Earth that are just barely under the ellipsoid and some that are above it. On average, it matches really well, and it can be described with this simple equation. This is the ellipsoid we use today, the one that's published by the NGA, and it's the foundation of the coordinate system used by GPS. It's embedded on about four and a half billion cell phones all over the planet, maybe as many as six billion, that enables us to have our very, very way of light. And this precisely calibrated coordinate system has led to some awkward corrections. Like at the Prime Meridian Museum, GPS tells tourists that the actual line is 102 meters east in an unremarkable field. Ecuador's monument to the equator is 240 meters off. And the circumference of the ellipsoid that best matches Earth's actual shape isn't a perfect 40,000 kilometers. It's 40,007.863. In Howtown's first two videos, Joss untangles COVID death data, and I dive into the science of dog vision. And there's more content on our Patreon. One of the things that's talked about a lot on the internet these days is these people who insist that the Earth is flat. This experiment would seem to prove that the Earth was a sphere. How do the flat earthers deal with this? They will tell you that Eratosthenes' experiment would also work on a flat Earth. And it, it turns out they're right. 